You are such a genuine gem. Thank you for clicking on my video. I'm Brooke McKenna, but today's case is about the drowning of the Farquharson boys. Father's Day is a day meant to celebrate the bond between a father and his children, a time to enjoy with the family and be grateful for those around you. Yet not everyone has the same experience and the same happiness surrounding this day, especially the members of the family we will be talking about today. The surviving members, that is. Were these deaths a tragic accident or an incomprehensible murder? By the way, I post so much content like this. It is my absolute passion to tell these stories and I mean no harm or disrespect when I do so. So if that's something you'd like to support me in doing, all you have to do is make sure you are subscribed with the post notification bell on, giving this video a thumbs up and leaving a nice comment down below. I post every single Thursday and then there are surprise Sundays and this month I am posting every Sunday as well. So now let's get back to the story. So it was 2005 in Australia, and the Farquharson family lived in Winchelsea, which was a small community around 2,000 residents. The Farquharsons consisted of Robert and Cindy, who had three children, Jay, Tyler, and Bailey. They were 10, 7, and 2 years old. The oldest, Jay, was known to be this responsible and smart boy with a very dry sense of humor and a passion for firefighting, football, movies, and karate. He was a generous boy. Boy just like his father though and he loved taking care of his little brothers. He also loved making money by mowing his poppy's lawns. Yet he had a very ornery side to him as well. He loved the adult jokes that he would hear in movies that he shouldn't have really been able to understand but he still did anyways. Tyler was known to be the more sensitive and loving little boy. He wanted affection from everyone, especially his mother. He was also quite the foodie and he loved hot dogs, mud cakes, and grandma's veggie soup, but strained. Tyler was really goofy too. He always wanted to make people laugh with his cross-eyed faces and his plastic poop pranks. Bailey was quite the personality too, even though he was only two years old. He was magnetic and talkative, even if it was hard to understand, and he actually knew how to get his way. If he didn't like something, he would say, this is quack, mom, and then if he got in trouble, he would say, but me just a baby, mom. They all had their own personalities, their own dynamics, and they fought like regular siblings, but they loved each other so dearly, and that was very obvious. Robert and Cindy had actually met in 1990 as teenagers in the same exact town they had grown up there and Cindy had actually been through a very rough time with her relationships. A previous boyfriend of hers had actually passed away tragically in a car accident and so when this happened, Cindy and Robert got really close as friends because Robert was kind of her shoulder to lean on during this grieving process. Shortly after this, they began a relationship together and they were actually both laborers and they began renting a house together. This was Cindy's home first, but Robert did move in with her, and they lived only a short distance away from their family and friends. Everybody in this community knew each other, and it was kind of the type of community where once you were born there, you stayed. They were renting so they could have some place to live while they were building a bigger house on the other side of town. Four years later, Cindy did fall pregnant. Now, this was in October of 1994 and Jay was born. They were unmarried, but this didn't bother Cindy at all. And three years later, Tyler was born and that is when Robert actually proposed. The beginning years of the 2000s were kind of a balance of darkness and light for this family. Robert's mother had been diagnosed with cancer but she was able to make it to Robert and Cindy's wedding, which was so amazing for them. But in 2002, she did pass away, and while Robert and Cindy attended the funeral, they also welcomed their third child, Bailey, that year. By Father's Day of 2005, which in Australia is September 4th, a Sunday, Robert had taken his boys out in his 1989 VN Commodore. This was a white car, and it was one of the two vehicles that the family had. 
bad. They had woken him up with presents that morning. In fact, they had gotten him a photo that was framed and he teared up and he absolutely loved it. And then he was going to take them out to have a kind of a lunch slash dinner at KFC. This was special because it was kind of far away from this small town and they didn't often get to go. So it was kind of a special treat. The boys had asked him to take them there and that is exactly what he did. Cindy stayed home, they had this wonderful dinner and then when they were driving back home to her, the unthinkable happened. The next time Cindy saw her family, her children were missing. Robert was at her front door soaking wet and two men she had never seen before were nearby and all Robert said to her was, I've had an accident. I couldn't get the kids. They're in the water. It's too late. Cindy was not waiting for the cops. She got into her car. She made Robert get in the back to give her directions and she began going over a hundred miles per hour. You see around 7 p.m. two men had been driving along Princess Highway. This was Shane and Tony who noticed it up in front of them a car kind of swerved and then sped away and they didn't know why the car had done this until they got up to this area when a man jumped out in front of them. This man was waving his arms and Shane actually got the car to stop in time to not hit this man but he pulled over to see what was going on and this man immediately sprinted up to him at first he believed this man was actually trying to end his life on that road and he had just you know swerved away and saved his life but then when he stopped this man was kind of running up to him and he said that he had just killed his kids he began cussing, saying, what have I done? He was asking these men for a lift back to see his Mrs. Cindy and tell her what had happened. He then asked if he could grab a smoke off of them, and Shane and Tony found this extremely odd, but they gave him a cigarette anyway, and when they tried to ask him what happened, he said that he put the car in the dam, and then he refused to tell them where exactly it was. He was mumbling, he seemed out of breath, he seemed distant, and he was really having a hard time breathing. Breathing. But when Shane and Tony finally told him, you know, we're not giving you a ride back, but you can use our phones, you can call an ambulance, he didn't want to. They were starting to doubt his story because they looked in the nearby dam and they saw no sign of anything being inside. It was completely still water. It wasn't like anything was bubbling up from the bottom. There wasn't debris anywhere. It didn't look like there was a crash. And so Shane was believing maybe this man had Down syndrome or a type of disability that, you know, maybe he was wasn't in his right mind at that time and they handed him a phone again to call an ambulance but he again refused. They then offered to go into the dam and try to you know find his children that he was talking about being in there but he said it was no use because they were already dead. All he wanted to do was go back and tell Cindy before someone else found out and told her. He told them that same exact phrase about a hundred times and so finally they decided to drive him to the Cindy woman's home to let her know. But as they approached the home, the man that they were driving said, Cindy is going to kill me. Shane ran to the door calling for Cindy. She came out and immediately after seeing Robert began asking where her kids were and that is when Robert told her and she began hysterically screaming but when she asked where they were he finally answered the question that he had not answered for Shane and Tony and that was exactly where they were at. He told her they were near the overpass of the dam in Victoria and that's when Cindy completely lost it. She began hitting him and she asked him why he didn't stay with them and he said that they were already dead. He then began saying that he had this coughing fit where he passed out and when he woke up, they were already in the water. He couldn't get them out. Shane was holding Cindy back, trying to comfort her because Robert wasn't really doing a great job of comforting her. And that's when he actually decided that it wasn't working to, you know, try to comfort Cindy. She was hysterical. These were her children. And so he decided to drive off and go and get the cops himself because he was already regretting leaving this dam that he didn't even know had children in it because he thought this man could be making it up. But now he realized there were children and they were most likely at the bottom of that dam. In the light of the house, Shane had also realized that he recognized this man. He was the same man that would mow lawns around town and had since he was a teenager. Everybody knew him. 
Robert said that he would wait there for the cops to come, but Cindy told him that's not what was going to happen. She told him to get in the back of the car and he was going to point out exactly where the car crashed. She begged Robert to tell her where it was on the drive and he wasn't speaking to her, but when she went past the overpass, he told her she had gone too far. However, she would never hear those words because she had already stopped the car, gotten out, and began running around looking for her babies. It was 7.45 p.m. by this point, and Cindy had actually gone to this point of the fence that had been broken, and there were tire tracks in the grass, and she began to panic. Her mind was beyond the point of being able to comprehend this tragedy, but she somehow called 911 or 000 in Australia and she was able to spit out, I need an ambulance, I need police, my husband's had an accident, we can't find the car, I don't know where the car is, we can't see a thing, it's dark, I wasn't in the car with him, my three kids, they're in the water and we, they can't find the car, oh my god, oh my god. Around 20 minutes later, investigators arrived at 8.07 p.m. and the divers and investigators began to search the water for any sign because they still had not located this car. And this dam, although it was deep, it wasn't very big. And so Cindy and Robert were actually down by the water, but so was a man named Stephen Moles and a man named Tony. Tony was the one in the car with Shane when they found Robert soaking wet. Stephen and Tony were both in the water in their full clothes searching and trying to find something, trying to see if these boys were still alive in order to save them. It was freezing cold, dark water, but they didn't care. They went deeper and deeper. When investigators got there, they were told to get out of the water before the hypothermia hit because they had no, you know, protective suits on. They didn't even know what they were doing and the professionals had just gotten there to take over. They were also told to go home, but Cindy would be staying right there. She was found in her vehicle rocking back and forth in the front seat and crying. She asked them how long it was going to take and what the chances were and unfortunately, she knew what the answer was when the investigators told her it was very slim that they would still be alive. The dam was actually a narrow strip of land between the main road and the railway line that was always full of water no matter what. Even if they were in a drought, there was water and it was quite deep. Six hours later, the car was recovered. It was 2 a.m. and the divers had been working all night long. The car ended up being 25 feet under the water and basically it went all the way down. Now, Beck Kasky was a police diver as well as the first woman to ever join the Victoria Police Search and Rescue Squad. She had joined five years prior and she was the one to go into the water that day to help find these boys. Now, once suited up, she headed down and she said that it was so dark under there because it was basically pure mud that it was difficult to even see her hand in front of her face. So she was having to feel around the area. That's when something bumped into her head and upon feeling, she realized that this was actually the wheel of the car. As she was feeling around, she realized that this car had taken a nosedive and just stayed there, standing upside down on the nose. The driver's side door was also open and then she felt a small, person's head protruding from the car and she cupped the face in her hands and knew that this person was already dead. So she slowly pushed it back inside the car and went back up to tell investigators that she had found the location and slowly they pulled it up. It was full of water and the three bodies were inside, each of which were unbuckled. Beck said she wasn't afraid of what she would find, but she was afraid that she couldn't find it. Mainly, she was grateful that most of the boy's family members had gone away so they didn't have to watch the bodies being pulled out of that dam. Stephen was still in the area though, and he was needed to identify the boys, and he was brought over to where Jay had been put in a body bag, and he was showed his face, and Stephen immediately began to break down, and he prayed over Jay and he asked God to take them and nurture them forever before asking investigators if he could see the other two boys who were still in the car. He could see them, but he was not allowed to touch them and the coroner was talking to him saying that he had never seen anything as bad as this. Robert was admitted to the hospital for hypothermia, whereas Cindy was admitted to the hospital for shock. 
Robert had no drugs or alcohol in his system and he was oddly calm, but they were both released within a few days and they were fine. Well, as fine as you can be after finding your son's deceased. The funeral had over 500 people in attendance, but it was oddly quiet. Everyone was so silent and solemn and they were just really grieving this horrific loss in this small community because 500 people was a lot of that small town to be in this church and they actually had to set out folding chairs outside of the church because there wasn't enough room. The only sound anybody heard was the song Holy Grail by hunters and collectors playing in the background because this was actually Jay, Tyler, and Bailey's favorite song. Two-year-old Bailey's little coffin was the most heartbreaking of all because it was so tiny, but each of the boys had a bouquet of red roses and baby breath and they were all carried out. Cindy and Robert were sitting arm in arm as Cindy broke down and was basically holding on to him and he was holding her up. Robert sat with a dazed expression and Cindy didn't blame Robert for what had happened. She said that he was a wonderful father and this was a terrible accident. While they watched the coffins being put into this hearse, they both just stared ahead and they both looked like they were in complete disbelief as Robert hugged her. Meanwhile, investigators began to look at this from the perspective of foul play. That's when they realized that this could have been more than a simple car accident. Robert was brought in for questioning two days later and Sergeant Gerald Clancy had asked him what happened. He said, I managed to get out and then all of a sudden we were going down and I tried to get around to the other side and I couldn't. I must have just said, hold on, hold on. It just nosedive. I'd do anything to get them back and I've got to live with this for the rest of my life. He was questioned for the next four hours. He then requested and took a polygraph test, but then he was released without charge. Robert was a 37 year old man. He was living with his father and he was struggling with money, but everyone around him claimed that he loved his children. They said that he would work 24 seven to give them everything that they could possibly need or want. But then when he came home, he always had time to play with them and was always playing with them outside. And his cousin said that it was a relief that they released him because they had no idea how hard it was for Cindy and Robert to have lost their children. He was said to be a hard worker and he was pleasant, although he sometimes had a temper. Yet many didn't know the full story of the Farquharson family from the perspective of inside their home. You see, Robert had started a company after their first son, Jay, was born, and he ended up taking a redundancy package from his employer, and he started a lawn mowing franchise, but this ended up failing and losing him $40,000. When the two got married, many actually didn't know that that day, Cindy was having doubts about marrying him. She said that she wasn't that attracted to him, honestly, but he was a reliable man who was always there for her and he could do the things that Cindy needed and at the same time Cindy was almost like a mother to him. She had to do things for him that his mother should have taught him how to do. He refused to help with the boys even with the smallest things like changing their diapers and so that was all on her as well. But then when his mother died of cancer he became very moody and unpredictable. He would harass Cindy and he would tease the boys passive aggressively until they felt like they were being bullied. They would cry and they would run into their room and slam the door. A year before the boys died, Cindy had actually said that her relationship with Robert was a mortgage, not a marriage, and she was over it. That November, she told him the marriage was over and she left for a while while he packed his bags and moved back in with his father. She then left to file for divorce and took back her maiden name. They did have shared custody of the boys, but 10 months later, Cindy was very happy. You see, she had met a man named Stephen Moles and he was her everything. They were best friends. He was actually the concrete contractor who poured the slab for the new home that Robert and Cindy were building together. Stephen had three children himself. He had also gone through a very messy divorce. So that meant he wasn't really ready for a relationship, but they had met when Cindy and Robert were still married. So they were just friends in that beginning phase anyway. So they continued to be so for quite a while. Stephen actually was friends with Robert too, and he would give 
Robert relationship advice when he would start coming to him complaining about Cindy and the kids and you know he just wouldn't stop complaining no matter how much Stephen tried to give him as far as advice. But finally Stephen said you're acting like a big baby you have a wonderful wife and children and you're not acting like a father. And so at this point of course Robert just stopped going to Stephen. The two got separated and you know we know what happened next but Stephen was actually the one at the dam after Cindy got there, she called him and he came out and was one of the men searching through the water. That Wednesday before the crash, so the crash was Sunday, the Wednesday before, Robert and Cindy had talked on the phone and Robert was complaining about being sick and working too hard. He said that they needed to sell the house that they were building so that he could get a place on his own. He said he was never going to get ahead because he had to pay child support and he was thinking of moving to Queensland to get a home. Cindy said, you know, you can't leave your kids behind. Don't do that. She said, you don't have to pay child support if that will help you. Just go and get like a one bedroom apartment. You should be able to afford that. But even then, Robert still continued to just relish in this negativity that he had basically put on himself. Cindy claimed that she knew he was depressed, but he sounded very hopeless that day. And in fact, she called his mother after this call and, and she told her to just watch out. But Cindy thought that just meant that Robert was suicidal, not that he could ever be homicidal. That Sunday, Father's Day, he had to work until three, but after that, Cindy was to drop the kids off at his home and that's exactly what they would do. She told him to have the kids back by 7.30 and that was the plan for the night, nothing too crazy but it was also found that Robert had been diagnosed with avoidant personality disorder as well as bouts of depression. He had gone to a psychologist and he had also gotten on antidepressants for this. He was also said to be stalking Cindy in a very obvious manner during this time. Stephen, you know, Cindy's friend, kind of boyfriend after her and Robert had separated, had said that that night at the dam, he had gotten there to help find the children and Robert was there just standing, not looking anywhere. And he turned to Stephen and asked him where his smokes were. Stephen kind of snapped at him asking how he could worry about smokes at a time like this. He asked him, have you been drinking or doing any sort of drugs? And Robert said no. And Stephen said, well, are you sick? And he said, yeah, I've had the flu. Finally, Stephen said, why didn't you get the children out? And Robert snapped back, I tried to get them out. I'm soaking wet, look at me. And he was like going at Stephen at this time. And Stephen ended up snapping back and saying if he didn't get out of his effing face, he was going to effing kill him. That's when Stephen and Tony made their way into the water to search, but Robert didn't join them. He just stood on the sidelines with his arms crossed watching them. They quickly realized that this water was going deeper and deeper and it, the cold water made it hard to breathe. They were losing feelings in their legs and their hands and they were forced to get out, but they needed to to be able to survive. And that is when Stephen saw that Robert still had done nothing. He wasn't even going to make sure that Cindy was okay as she was sobbing near the dam. He said that he looked like a council worker supervising a project with no emotion on his face. Hearing this, investigators weren't so sure about this accident. They had also found several odd things about this crash. In fact, they revisited the crime scene to reenact this accident and they found that when going down this road in a car, when you didn't have your hands on the steering wheel, it kind of did veer off the road. However, it went left and the dam was on the right side. They did get Robert's car to use the same kind of experiment to see what his car did. And it did veer slightly more to the right, but not enough to officially launch him into the dam. They also sent this car in for testing to see if anything had happened mechanically. And it was found that the steering nor the brakes had failed and the car was not speeding at the time of the crash. Yet that is when they found that the headlights, heater and ignition were all set to off. Something that would have had to been done manually and someone driving down the road wouldn't have turned off. They also found zero skid marks on the road as if somebody had lost control before veering off. They would have had to do a 220 degree turn and also perfectly miss a nearby tree. 
Robert's friend, Greg King, then came forward saying that three months before the crash, Robert had said that he had a surprise for Cindy to pay her back big time. He said that he was going to take away the things that meant the most to her. When Greg asked what this was, he allegedly looked him in the eyes and said, kill them. And Robert then told him the entire plan of what he was going to do on Father's Day and saying that for Father's Day, every year for the rest of Cindy's life, she would suffer. For the sake of the truth, my conscience, and for the sake of three very precious little boys that we knew and loved, I had no choice but to speak out. When he came forward with this, Greg's wife said she had never heard about any of this, but Greg said that he suffered from PTSD from not telling anyone what he had heard because Robert would say dark things like this all the time and he didn't believe he was telling the truth. It was also found that Robert had booked his burial plot right next to where the boys were buried. And this was also where Cindy had booked hers so she could be next to her boys. Three months after the death, investigators went to the home of Robert's father to arrest him for murder. It was December 14th, 2005, and they quickly realized he wasn't home. He didn't run. He actually was at the police station with his lawyer. Shortly after, he was granted bail and released while awaiting trial. On August 21st of 2007, he went to trial at the Supreme Court of Victoria. 49 witnesses would testify, one of which was Cindy, and she was on his side. She said, I believe with all my heart that this was just an accident and that he would never hurt a hair on their heads. I don't believe this is murder. Robert's main excuse was still that coughing led him to black out, and while this is possible, it's not very common, and especially for someone who doesn't have asthma. It also doesn't stop instantly. Coughing would have occurred much longer into the night, but nobody around Robert that night heard him cough even once. Matthew Naughton, a specialist in sleep and respiratory medicine, testified that the condition is cough synope, and it is highly unlikely and extremely rare. But the owner of the property with the dam also testified and he said that seven cars had crashed through that fence at one point or another, but none of them went into that dam. Robert stuck with his excuse, he pled not guilty, but he did add that when the car submerged, Jay opened the passenger door and tried to get out. His defense said that he was shy, he was not trained to handle this emergency situation, and that is why he handled it so poorly. After six weeks and three hours of deliberation, he was found guilty of all three counts of murder. It had been found that the day of the verdict was also Jay's birthday, and there was a card and flowers found on his grave that said, Dear Jay, thinking of you on your birthday, love you, Dad. When this verdict was told to the court, Cindy broke down, and her and her mother had to be taken out by ambulance to go to a hospital. Was Robert Farquharson a triple killer who suffered from severe depression and anger, or was he just a mourning father whose life had changed forever because of a dreadful, tragic accident? Robert was sentenced to three life terms without the possibility of parole, and two years later, he was ordered to pay Cindy $225,000. Yet, Robert appealed this sentence in 2009. And on December 17th, it was overturned by three judges due to technical errors by the judge of his trial. He was granted a retrial and went free for the time. The next year his retrial began, the prosecution claimed that it was Cindy's ability to move on and be happy without him that caused him to have resentment and anger towards her that drove him to commit an almost unspeakable form of vengeance. During this trial, Cindy had changed her opinion. She now did believe her ex-husband was a killer. Then a new witness came forward. She claimed to have been on the road that night with Robert. She hadn't come forward in the first trial because she had actually been diagnosed with cancer. She thought that he was going to be in jail forever. And so she didn't really think she was needed until she realized that he was having a retrial. She came forward to say that she had been behind him on that very road and he continued to slow down and stop in front of her. She got to the point where she just wanted to get around him. She noticed as she drove around that he was completely transfixed on the right side of the road where the dam was. He was just looking that way and slowing down and she just kind of went past, but she noticed shortly after that in her rear view mirror, the headlights were veering to the right. She said that she didn't see any sort of coughing or a blackout or anything. They then asked the court 
What do you do in that situation? Well, you undo your own seatbelt, of course. You undo the door to the car closest to you, of course. You get out of the car, of course, without any effort to take any of your children with you, without any effort to open up any of the other doors of the car to release them from their restraints. Out you go, leaving those three panicking and helpless boys in that car on the dam. That's what you do. It took 11 weeks and three hours of deliberation to find him guilty once again. And he was sentenced to life with the possibility of parole in 33 years. Cindy now says that she doesn't wish death on Robert because she wants him to suffer with life. She said that all she wanted to do was be married and have children, but she picked the wrong man to marry. It's never gonna be enough. It's a life sentence for me. It should be a life sentence for him. She said that she only believed in him at first because she was in so much pain and that everything was a blur and denial was her only way of surviving. But she is now fighting to make sure that Robert is not buried next to the children that he killed. Oh, I can't understand what, what goes through a father's mind in the terms of, I have to kill my child to get to her. It doesn't have to be like that. It truly doesn't. You're never ever the same person. And then I think, why do fathers feel that they have to take their children's lives in order to get back at the mother? I thought things were fairly amicable between us. I had no idea that he would ever harm the children. If anything, I thought he was going to harm himself. Cindy did get remarried to Stephen and they now have two children who are Hezekiah and Isaiah together. But Stephen said, I miss both the person that I was and the true happy-go-lucky fun-loving woman that I met in Cindy. Both I am not sure that either of us will ever be or see again. But as a father, how could he leave his sons in there? I know that as a sister, there is no way I could leave that car without trying to get out as many people as possible, even if that meant that I lost my life. There's a difference between freezing when you are in a flight or fight situation and just not caring to fight at all. The most heartbreaking part to me is that I believe the oldest, Jay, could have survived. But I believe he is the one who unbuckled his brothers, who were too young to do it themselves, and tried to get them out. I believe he was more of a man and had more of a heart than Robert could even fathom. Because while he could have escaped within time, he looked at his younger brothers and said, I'm not leaving you here to die alone. And he unbuckled them and he tried his hardest to save them all. But unfortunately, he couldn't. But I believe that Jay is the hero here. But there are still people who say maybe this was just an accident. Maybe he really didn't mean to kill his kids that night. We await the day that justice prevails and this brutally wronged father of three special boys walks free. They blame the media. This was an accident. Those little kids did nothing but love their father and wanted to celebrate him that day because they had a father who didn't deserve to be one. Although this was kind of a dark case, I do want to wish any of the fathers out there Happy Father's Day. If you were a single mother, Happy Father's Day to you as well because you deserve that recognition for all that you do. If you are a stepfather or an adopted father or a foster father, you deserve that praise as well. So Happy Father's Day to you all. Remember that I post so much content like this, so there will be a playlist here to choose from and my last video here to choose from if you want to watch more from me. But don't ever forget to speak up. Your voice is powerful. Enough. And I love you to absolute pieces. Okay, bye.